and we welcome everybody. I'll be your facilitator today. I'm Linda Warren from Drambi Environmental Consulting. <clears throat> and we have with us today several speakers who will be talking with you about the Virginia, Virginia Pollinator Smart Solar Project. So this meeting, we're really glad you could join us. And we're going to be discussing <clears throat> the Pollinator Smart Program as well as how it can help you. And we really look forward to hearing from all of you as well uh, about what you do and how what you do might relate in to Pollinator Smart. So we're going to take a few minutes first and do some introductions for everyone who is on with us. And then we'll get into the presentation part. You'll hear from DEQ as well. And we're going to talk about the benefits of the program. So as you have come in, we're going to check your microphone. Not everybody's on video, but if you want to be on video, you certainly can be. And if you could, just let us know. Go ahead and, and speak. Let us know your name, where you're from, and if there's anything that you do in your work that would relate in some way to the Virginia Pollinator Smart Program. And I know Today is the time for you to learn about that, but if there's something that you might be able to say just beforehand, how you might be interested in it or how it might help you. So let's go ahead and start. Um, and it's, I don't have everyone's name on here, but I do have a few. So it looks like P. Scully. There you go. Good morning. And how are you this morning? Good, good to hear you. So I um, was actually just um, brought over by a co-worker to kind of sit in and listen this morning and I'm just looking forward to see what I can gather out of today and, and carry forward on, the, on my day to day. Oh, I've lost you as you are muted. Very, there we go. Very good. Where are you from? Uh, I'm currently residing in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Terrific. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> we have someone who's, the name isn't there, but it's SMM19503. Oh, good morning. This is Beth Major with Virginia DEQ. <laughs> oh, great. And I'm involved in, in uh, the PBR permitting program um, here for, for what's considered small, smaller solar and renewable energy projects, 150 megawatts and smaller. Thanks. We have Jefferson Flood. Yes, can you all hear me? We can. Yes, good morning. Um, my name's Jeff Flood, as you said, and I'm um, working out of Richmond, the DQ uh, headquarters there with, um, with the Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program, and we have funded several native plant guides and campaigns over the years, so this is just uh, staying in the loop and seeing how we can help um, and leverage resources. Terrific. Allison Oliver. And I know not everyone's mute button will always work, but great. Go ahead, Allison. Oh, you don't have a microphone. Okay, great. And you'll notice everyone, you'll see that there's a chat window on your screen. So if you see the mute button and the stop video along those lines, you should see the chat window as well. And so you're welcome to chat in there at any point in time. And if you don't have a microphone, go ahead and, and chat. And it looks like um, Allison is from Powhatan County. So very good. Ashley, Ashley Austin. Hi, uh, this is Ashley. I'm with the town of Farmville. I'm just kind of here to see what this is all about. Great, welcome, glad you're here. Donna. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me okay? Good morning. We can hear you. So I'm Donna Bowen. I'm with the Hanover County Planning Department. Um, we do get site plans and building permits um, for um, whether it's a farm of solar panels or something on the top of someone's barn. Um, and I am interested in learning more about how they can use the space around these panels for something like this. In fact, we've had others mention it in meetings before, so this would be a great start to incorporate that. Terrific. Johnny, Johnny Bork. 
Good morning. How are you doing? Good morning. All right. I'm with uh, Appomax County and uh, just wanted to see how we could apply this program here in our county. We're starting to see more and more uh, solar interest. So that's where we're coming from. Very good. Glad you're here. Monica Elder. I'm with Charlotte County um, and work with planning and zoning some. We have several utility scale solar projects that have already been approved by the county and one other we're considering now. So we'll use this information um, to move forward with those projects. That's fabulous. We have S. Reynolds. Okay, um, no microphone there. And they're also with Powhatan County. Okay, thank you for that. And I think, is there anyone else besides our presenters who have joined us who hasn't had a chance to do an intro? Anne. Hi, I'm uh, Anne Ducetis from Gloucester County. Uh, similar to what someone else just said, we have uh, um, several solar facilities that are coming um, to the county. So just wanted to hear um, of options for plantings for those facilities when they come online. Okay, very, very good. So if anyone else joins in at some point, we might ask for their intro as well, but thanks for being here this morning. And I'm going to turn it over to DEQ, Sharon and Renee. Okay, good morning. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, hi, um, I'm sorry, I do not have a camera. Uh, my name is Sharon Baxter, I'm with DEQ, and I wanted to welcome you all to the webinar. Uh, we've been working with DCR on this project for, gosh, I don't know, two, almost three years now, and it's it's really been um, a joy. It, uh, I've gotten to learn so much, and I, I think you you all take away a lot w with you th today. And But I just wanted to give you um, a little background on where we are with solar in the Commonwealth. You heard my colleague, Beth Major, introduce herself earlier, and uh, she is in the thick of it, so she can correct me if I get any of this wrong. We permit what are called um, the small projects, so under 150 megawatts. Um, through those are done through DEQ. Uh, the State Corporation Commission does the ones that are larger. Um, and I, you know, I heard everybody introducing themselves and talking about how there is growing interest in their counties. Um, and I think we're all very aware that solar has really taken off in the Commonwealth. Um, we think that's only going to continue. Uh, and one of the main drivers is the Virginia Clean Economy Act, which um, is pushing the state toward um, off of fossil fuels and onto renewables and sets a, a goal of 1600 megawatts of solar and onshore wind. Um, and so to put that in perspective, um, Beth in our little group was telling us the other day, we have permitted 68 projects so far that permit or that produce 5,000 megawatts and cover six, 60,000 acres. So the goal of 16,000 megawatts, that's more than triple, um, is really going to mean that there's gonna be a lot of uh, you know, additional acreage. And um, as Beth said, those projects are coming to a location near you. So you know, we're really looking to make sure that um, we can marry a, a few priorities for the state together. Um, we all want the renewables, but we also want to make sure that um, we're generating habitat or creating habitat and, and supporting agriculture. So, um, so that's, uh, I don't know, Beth, if you wanted to add anything on the, the state of solar. Well, I was, Sharon, I was just <laughs> going to say real quick so that everybody knows what kind of time frame we're under. Uh, Dominion has a, uh, a mandate to have 30% electricity generated by renewables by 2030. And um, the entire state has a target of 100% renewable by 2050. Um, and that's according to the governor's executive order number 43. So this train is not slowing down. If anything, um, we, are, we are going to be um, asked to expedite some of these uh, processes moving forward to meet these, these goals and objectives. Thanks. Great. Okay, and so now I'm going to turn it over to Renee Hypes uh, from DCR, and she'll uh, continue to welcome. But thank you all for joining us today. So, good morning, everyone. Um, 
My name is Renee Hypes and I'm the project review coordinator with the Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation Division of Natural Heritage and I'm also a member of the Virginia Pollinator Smart Team. With the coming of age of solar industry in Virginia and the potential development of over 60,000 acres as pointed out by my colleague at DEQ, it became an important opportunity to encourage solar developers and operators to consider an ecologically responsible approach to solar development. So in 2019, the Department of Environmental Quality and DCR teamed up with other experts to establish the Pollinator Smart Program for Virginia. And as you can see from the slide, the Pollinator Smart Team was formed along leading experts in the field. And you're gonna hear from some of those experts today. I wanted to mention Virginia's first Pollinator Smart Gold Certified Solar Site is at the Coppel Elementary School in Westmoreland County. The ground-mounted solar system designed by SunTribe at the school meets 100% of the school's energy needs and will save Westmoreland County Public Schools an estimated $3.6 million in energy costs. The height of the system's 2100 panels will allow native pollinator friendly species to be planted under the arrays, while it's also designed to consider other factors including seed mix, grass diversity, educational collaboration opportunities, and vegetation management plans. I wanted to mention this idea of planting native plant species, including pollinator species, can be applied far beyond solar facilities. For instance, brownfields, including reclaimed mine sites and Superfund sites could be great candidates for revegetating the sites with native pollinator species. Uh, the Mountain Valley Pipeline, working in consultation with DCR and others have developed seed mixes to include native plant species in their maintained right-of-ways. In addition, Transmission line projects due to the open canopy and maintain right of way provide suitable habitat for the planting of native pollinator species. Uh, the Virginia Department of Transportation and the Blue Ridge Prism Group have worked along with DCR to consider the planting of native species within their right of ways, the removal of invasive species from their seed mixes, and research to determine which native species are the most suitable for Virginia's right of ways. VDOT has also established native pollinator areas at some of the rest stops. Uh, the Interagency Wetland Mitigation Banking Team has made recommendations for the use of native pollinators on many of their proposed wetland mitigation banks. As mentioned in the Pollinator Smart Business Plan, native pollinator species could be the future crop for some farmers. Parks, schools, and landowners all have opportunities to consider the planting of native plant pollinators as part of their landscaping plans. Research has shown as little as a half acre of pollinator habitat can be beneficial for pollinators. Now with that, I'd like to hand it over to Katie Cyrus of VHB, another Virginia Pollinator Smart team member, to talk about the certification process and the Virginia Pollinator Smart program resources that were developed by the team. Katie? Hi, everybody. Um, just give me one second while I share my screen. Um, I wanted to start by showing you guys um, photos of Copal, which Renee just mentioned um, from just a month ago after it was planted with pollinator species. Um, so this is year one establishment. I think it was seeded in I can't even remember, it might have been March even. So this is pretty, this is pretty good here. Um, let me see if I can get the, there we go. And here's another photo of it and a third photo. So I think this looks really great for the first um, year. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn off my video while I talk as well so I don't get distracted. Um, a little background about me. Um, I am an environmental scientist with VHB. Um, my background is in field botany, specifically identifying native species. Um, and I have been working on this project from the beginning with the team. 
Um, and I'm going to give you an overview of the Virginia Pollinator Smart Solar Program certification process and the associated program materials. Um, Renee and Sharon did a great job explaining how the program came to be. And we're in year two of our program, very near the end of year two as well. That ends in September. Um, and very quickly, I just wanted to talk about the first year, which is when we developed the program from the ground up. Um, Renee already touched on the team, but um, I'm going to do it again. So we assembled a team of experts with DEQ and DCR being the lead agencies and we, VHB, were the lead consultants. We worked with a team of experts, including Fresh Energy, Pollinator Partnership, Prairie Restorations, Inc., Meadville Land Services, Ernst Pollinator Services, Ernst Seeds, Durambi Environmental Consulting as well. Um, and you'll see that a few of these people are also on the call um, and we'll hopefully have some, be able to chime in at the end when we start our discussion. Um, across the team, we have an interdisciplinary uh, team of experts in plant and pollination ecology, horticulture, land management, environmental policy, and the solar energy industry. Um, we began creating this program with an exhaustive literature review uh, because we wanted everything that we put into the program to be founded in scientific literature and research. We also didn't want to reinvent the wheel though, and a lot of work assimilating research and putting it into practice to create these pollinator friendly solar sites has already been done. There are currently about 15 states with varying degrees of pollinator friendly programs, the very first being Minnesota in 2016. And um, just to give you an idea, some nearby states with programs include Maryland, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania. It was also important to us that a program at least be comparable to these states, and a common theme that we found in these programs is the idea of a scorecard. A scorecard is a metric-based way to evaluate the relative ecological health of a site. So in layman's terms, that means that passing a state scorecard uh, means the site was installed correctly, has established well, and is providing habitat for pollinator species. The majority of states with pollinator friendly solar programs have developed their own scorecard and so we decided to follow suit. Uh, but I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Throughout the course of year one, we had uh, three stakeholder meetings while the program was still in development. We had over 100 attendees, uh, including solar developers, energy providers, consultants, nonprofits, seed suppliers, landscape professionals, research scientists, interested citizens, and local, state, and federal government. And these meetings were invaluable and really helped kind of dictate the, the direction that we went um, in designing our program. Um, so through the results of our research and information gathering, we ended up creating five major components to the program. The scorecards, there are two, one for new sites, another for established sites, the comprehensive manual, which contains all the information you need to know in order to participate in the program from start to end, um, the monitoring plan, which is a scientific way to make sure your site is on track and providing high quality habitat, the Virginia Solar Site Native Plant Finder, uh, which would help determine um, if the seed mix and plants on your site are native, and also to help the initial seed mix design process um, by selecting appropriate species, and the business plan, which helps the state develop a local native seed supply. I'm going to take you through a high-level overview of each product. product. Um, first, I want to go over the certification process that we designed. Um, the results of year one were officially released at the beginning of this year, and so the program is now live and available online. Um, we sent you the link already, uh, but again, it's uh, pollinatorsmartva.org. So the certification process. Um, first, I want to say that the Virginia Pollinator Smart Program is, is currently completely voluntary for solar developers or owner operators to participate in. If they, like SunTribe, want to participate in the program, then these are the steps that they would need to take. Each step is explained in great detail in the comprehensive manual. And so really quickly, I just want to show you the manual, um, at least the table of contents. 
So I'm going to be flipping back and forth between the PowerPoint and the materials um, so you can actually see them. Um, first, this is the this is the website that the link that I just spoke about would take you to. Um, if you scroll down, it has all of our materials here. Um, the comprehensive manual is exactly what it says, comprehensive. Um, so if you have any questions at all, uh, this is where you, where you should look. Um, I just wanted to go to the table of contents to give you an overview of what's in here. Um, first, we have an introduction about, you know, why we need the program, how it came to be, and, you know, why what we're doing is uh, supports pollinators and the use of native species. Um, then we moved to site suitability and planning, which uh, is really the first step in the certification process, followed by uh, designing a vegetation management plan, um, which you can look at as the planning design process of creating the installation in the first place. The manual moves into the installation process, um, how, to, how to install the site, um, and then how to maintain it through integrated vegetation management. This is something that Doug is going to speak about more later. Um, and then finally, how to monitor your sites to make sure that they are continuing to be successful and continuing to provide the habitat that we're looking for. And Katie, I'm going to just mention to everyone, if you look in your chat window, as Katie is talking through these different references, um, Jessica from our team, our consultant team, is also providing the links to some of these references along the way. So you'll be able to have that through the chat. Thanks. Go ahead, Katie. Yep. Okay. I also wanted to point out um, Appendix A and Appendix B down here. Um, so Appendix B is the A is the scorecard and scorecard user's guide. So basically that walks you through uh, question by question, our thought process behind it, um, why we think it's important to evaluate, and then how you evaluate it, what we're looking for as far as criteria. And then Appendix B is the monitoring plan, which really lays out you know, how you would design um, and continue to monitor your site in order to fill out the scorecard in sub subsequent years. Um, if there's anything that you need to know, uh, you basically, you can just click in the table context and it will take you there. Um, there is also a glossary, so if you have any questions about uh, any of the terms we use today, those would be uh, in the comprehensive manual as well. Um, so back to my presentation here. <clears throat> Everyone starts with a potential pollinator friendly site up here. It could be a potential solar site on development, could be an existing site where the vegetation is going to be converted to native species. You'll notice the green circle with a QP features prominently in this flow chart. Uh, QP stands for qualified professional, which we define as a person with experience in site feasibility. Right. So we define as a person with experience in site feasibility, management planning, installation, vegetation monitoring, and or permitting for revegetation activities related to the Pollinator Smart Program. Um, that may sound wordy, but it's purposefully broad. So we don't want to exclude anyone who is qualified to do this kind of work. Um, However, it is important to us that the designers of a pollinator friendly site do have a background, at least in these types of things. Um, so as you can see, the certification process lasts 10 years. Um, the first certification event starts in year zero on the left hand side here. Um, and that is prior to installation. Um, and then recertification happens every two years for 10 years. Um, in, in year 10, a long-term management vegetation plan is created and submitted along with the scorecard. So if the plan's approved in year 10, then the site is effectively certified for the lifespan of the project. Um, so again, there's an initial certification and then there are biennial certifications for 10 years. Um, and this is because it takes quite a while for a site to fully established. So recertification effectively ensures that careful attention is being paid to the trajectory of the site such that it's continually providing high quality habitat for pollinators uh, over and over again as opposed to just during the uh, you know first year initial installation. Um, 
the first step of the process is a site suitability analysis. Um, and again, this is in the comprehensive manual. It's an information gathering site visit that helps inform the design of the pollinator smart installation. Environmental factors such as soil conditions, hydrology, topography, existing vegetation, such as the presence of invasive species or crops, and more all come together to determine which native species would establish well and thrive on a site. These factors also determine how a site should be prepared. For example, if the soils are highly compacted or a light tilling might be needed, um, how they'll be managed throughout the course of the program. For example, if a site with well-established populations of invasive species um, would require more work than a site that's already in a semi-natural state. And it's important to recognize that no two sites are the same. And that's really why a site suitability analysis is always the first most necessary step of the program. Um, the next step is the vegetation management plan. Um, so the results of the site suitability analysis really inform the VMP. Um, the VMP is optional, but it's strongly recommended. Um, it is a living document that's updated frequently as part of our recommended IVM or adaptive management practices. It lays out clearly the site's goals, the relevant regulations that the site needs to comply with. And it also contains a summary of existing conditions, the methods being proposed for installation, the proposed monitoring plan, a schedule of maintenance and monitoring events, and as the years go on, past reporting and scorecards and other important documents such as herbicide application logs. Although it's optional, most items that go into a VMP really need to be done anyways um, over the course of a site. So all the VMP really does is put it all into one clear and concise place up front. Um, moreover, thinking about and planning for the components within the VMP is a good way to set your site up for success. Um, so that's why I say we, strong, we would strongly recommend it uh, for a developer. After all of that planning, information gathering design, the next step is to complete or submit the proposed or retrofit scorecard A and relevant attachments. So remember I said earlier, there are two forms of the scorecard. You'll see that they're very similar, except for one is for proposed sites and the other is for established sites. So the first scorecard really only comes in during the initial planning. And then after that, the second scorecard is the one that you'd be working with. Um, so I just want to show you what that scorecard looks like really quick. Again, this is on the website. So the first page is really just like definitions, instructions, uh, project details, contact info. And then um, there is a final score at the bottom, which is really the important part. So the to be certified, um, a developer would need to reach uh, between 88 or 80 and 99 points on the scorecard in order to be considered gold certified, which is the highest standard, um, it, they would need to have 100 or more points on the score. Um, the nice thing about the scorecard is that it is auto calculating. So you can see as I click things, the score changes up top. Um, some questions actually remove points. For example, if there are a ton of invasive species planned to be on site and no treatment, um, that would actually you know, remove uh, points as well as plan to use insecticides since that's not really compatible with a pollinator smart program. Everything else you gain points. For example, for preserving forests, um, adding habitat, nesting features such as bird boxes or the the bee tunnel sort of things um, and then points for this really falls under mostly seed mix design um, every you'll notice that things are broken out into different zones um, that's because like I said before no one site is the same not everybody can accommodate planting things underneath the panel zone. Sometimes it just needs to be around the perimeter or in the, the screening area. Um, so the area outside of the fence. Um, so anyways, uh, you'll have this link so you can look at this in more careful detail, but I just wanted you to see what I was talking about. So basically a developer would fill out the scorecard and they would submit it to the pollinator.smart at virginia.dcr.gov email that you've been getting emails from. And that triggers a 21-day review period for the review committee. 
The committee is made up of several state organizations and academic institutions. So as long as the scorecard is filled out correctly and it passes, the site would be certified, pollinator smart. Um, if it doesn't, then the scorecard would be kicked back for revisions and then it can be resubmitted after the issues are addressed. The submission of the scorecard triggers the year one clock. Um, so that's when installation actually happens. Uh, we chose to have installation occur after the scorecard submission and certification in case there are any questions or concerns about the review committee um, from the review committee about the seed mix or the design in the first place. Um, that way they're not sinking money into something that wouldn't work with the program. Um, so again, first scorecard is really more hypothetical planning purposes. Um, and then the second version of the scorecard is actually what's happening in subsequent years as the site establishes. So if in the proposed scorecard, the developer indicates that annual monitoring would occur, which is optional, um, and they get points for that in one of the questions, then this first monitoring event would occur in the late summer of the year the site was installed with pollinator species. The benefit of annual site inspections is that it's a more proactive approach and potential issues can be caught and corrected before recertification in the even years of the project, uh, which happens in two, four, six, eight, and then 10. So the results of these monitoring events are integrated into the vegetation management plan uh, for the site. So for example, if monitoring indicates a predominance of invasive species, then treatment would happen. Or if the monitoring showed that there are areas where the seed mix isn't establishing well, then reseeding would occur. So it's really um, just a way to inform how the habitat is going on the site um, and the, the state of it, the quality of it. Biannual monitoring happens in years two, four, six, and eight, and is required as opposed to the annual um, for recertification. If it's the same steps, you're doing the same thing, um, but uh, the main difference is one's optional. The monitoring plan describes how to design and conduct the monitoring events. Um, so let me just go ahead and flip over to that just so you can see it. Again, the monitoring plan is a standalone document on the website. It's also Appendix B in the comprehensive manual here. So we really recommend a plot-based scientific approach for this. Um, so this monitoring plan, uh, a qualified professional would basically read through it and they would learn um, basically how to determine the size of their sampling plots, where their plot should be, the number of plots they have, um, and whether they've sampled the site appropriately to accurately represent what's going on there. Um, in years, let me switch back. So then moving on to down here, scorecard version B, in years two, four, six, and eight, you they would fill that out um, and Again, sorry, I'm just going to be switching everywhere. Uh, so to scorecard B here, B. As you can see, it looks incredibly similar to the proposed sites. The difference is this is for established sites. Um, really, the main difference, questions are totally comparable um, because you're really looking at the same thing year after year. Um, it's just the wording. So whereas before something might say that it's planned to be that way, these say that the existing cover is that way. Um, and so whereas the first scorecard is filled out more on what you're planning to do, the scorecard is based on the actual results of your monitoring. So when something says that uh, you're looking at percent overall of existing cover, um, then that would really be calculated um, from the information that was gathered from your biennial monitoring event. Um, so again, this is, we're, we're really trying to base this in science and make it quantitative and something that can be done across many sites in the state um, with consistent results. Um, and so then they submit the scorecard as long as they pass it and it all makes sense. 
um, in the 21 day review period from the board, uh, it would be certified pollinator smart and then it would just continue this loop for years two through nine. Um, if something wasn't working or this, the site didn't meet the scorecard, then there would need to be revegetation remediation, maybe reseeding or more treatment of invasive species. Um, what, whatever needs to be done to bring the back up uh, the site back up in the scorecard to meet that certification threshold. Um, and so then once that happens, they would just fill out the scorecard again um, until it passes and then it would be certified. Um, again, that's kind of the benefit of the annual um, approach because you can sort of spot those things and correct them if they're there uh, before you even submit the scorecard. Year 10. Um, basically, it's the same steps, except for after monitoring, you also submit a long-term vegetation management plan. Um, you do that, you fill out your scorecard, um, and as long as those two things uh, pass muster, then the site is certified for the lifetime of the project. Um, and basically after that, the only thing that's required is just following the maintenance steps in the long-term vegetation management plan. Um, but there's no more filling out scorecards or anything for us. Um, so basically, that's the process. Um, I just wanted you guys to have an idea of uh, what we've been doing, how the materials really fit into this flow chart here. Um, and then for you, especially the scorecards, um, because that's, that's really uh, what all of this is based around. Um, I also want to switch gears for a second and talk about the final product I want to talk uh, cover, which is the Virginia Solar Site Native Plant Finder. Um, so as you can tell, there's a heavy emphasis on using native pollinator species for this program. That's because the focus of native species use um, helps preserve local pollinators, insects, birds, mammals, and other wildlife which have co-evolved with plants native to the region and depend on them for food and shelter. Um, and then I have outlined in red here the definition of a native plant for this program. Um, so plants indigenous to a given area, although the concept is typically defined in terms of geological time for practical purposes, uh, a native Virginia plant is one that currently lives in the state and is known to have been present prior to European or human colonization of North America. For the purposes of scorecard evaluation, a species is considered native if it appears in the Virginia Solar Site Native Plant Finder. Um, so basically, the Solar Site Native Plant Finder is a one-stop shop for both determining if a species is native to Virginia, and then also it's intended as a tool to help design these seed mixes in the first place. So the Native Plant Finder has 278 species commercially available, including pollinator species. Uh, that means that you can buy them right now. Um, queries conducted by counties and cities include, uh, queries are conducted uh, by county or city. So basically um, you can narrow this down to plants that are found in the location of the solar site. Um, so for example, if the site is in James City County, then you could actually fill out the drop down to say that and it would filter out anything that's not known to occur in the area. Um, and then you can also add things like uh, site conditions. So uh, is it full sun? Is it partially shaded? Um, is it wet or is it completely dry there? Um, are you looking for plants for certain seasons? For example, if it flowers in the spring versus the summer. Um, and then something really important for uh, designing around solar panels, the maximum height uh, that a plant grows. Um, you really you know, don't want your plants overtopping the panels because that would um, influence the productivity. Uh, so, the return results give details of the species that fit your query, um, including the habitat, location, et cetera. Um, it, I know that I said 278 before. That's the ones that are commercially available, but there are actually over 1,600 plant species in the database. So by default, the finder is set to search for commercially available species um, because those are really the ones that can make it into a seed mix. Um, but then when you start monitoring, um, other plants will establish naturally. So um, 
you know, when you get to your years one through 10, you can actually change the setting to see uh, all of the species in here to determine what's native. So if you select no under commercially available, it, dis it would display the species that aren't being sold right now. Um, so that is one way to kind of deal with that. If you wanted to get the whole result of anything you're querying, you can copy and paste it basically into an Excel file. And then, you know, if you have any questions, then you can email the pollinator smart email address. Um, and so quickly, I just wanted to show you sort of how the plant finder works. And then I'm going to turn it over to Doug. So there are two ways. You can search for something specific by name. So example, if you wanted to look for fescue, which we're not going to get any results because it's, it's not native, you would do that. Um, if you wanted to look for a sunflower, you could type that in and you would get some results here that include the scientific name, the common name, um, various um, descriptors about it. In the bottom one, if you were looking for something specific for a site, for example, something in full sun um, that is dry, is a flowering species. So pollinator just deals with whether it's a flowering species or whether it's like a, a grass or something like that, a sedge. Um, we'll go for Accomack County and then you hit submit and then it will give you just this long list of potential things that could be incorporated into a site. Um, when you go to more detail, it gives you the link. This, this is a great uh, resource here um, and it tells you where you can find the species. Uh, so they're available from Cardno and from Prairie Moon, this one, the habitat, um, and then all the places that the species has been found. Um, the digital atlas of the Virginia floor link is also great because it gives you this nice little map that sort of shows you the distribution of a species. It'll give you photos in most cases so you can see what it is and then it'll just give you um, a little bit more information which is also in the native plant finder. So that's kind of just a, a pretty in-depth honestly overview of uh, what we've been working on in our first year. Um, we're now in our second year and that is about to end and we have a lot of really great things planned for the third year. Um, so with that being said, I am going to turn it over now to Doug to talk Actually, about the hey, benefits. Can, mm -hmm. Katie, can I interrupt you? Can you pull your, um, your PowerPoint slide back up that has the flowchart? Yeah. Excellent. <clears throat> While Katie's doing that, I'll, I'll um, just mention that the, the reason why the plant finder works at a locality level is because <clears throat> it's, uh, the, the database that supports it is from the Flora of Virginia project. And uh, there are some key members with uh, DCR Natural Heritage that were involved in that effort. <clears throat> and, um, uh, but the, the solar site native plant finder is really a DCR product. It wasn't, it didn't, it wasn't one of the outcomes of this contract. We were just kind of brought in to help uh, envision some changes that could occur there. But really Renee and Kevin Heffernan and other folks, I mean, their team gets the, the uh, credit for that. And, and it really is an incredible resource. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> it's supported by, uh, again, the Flora of Virginia. So um, that's a, really the background behind it. I asked Katie to go to this slide because I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but you know, at a county level, if you're wondering how you could potentially incorporate a program like this into, you know, your county review process, let's say, or site plan review, um, it's right here. I mean, um, it, even though this is a reasonably, it seems like at, at face value, a reasonably complex program, we, f we fit 10 years on one page and it's all there. And let's say you had a site plan review where you were doing a special use permit and you had proffers, you could tie proffers to this program and you'd have the entire um, monitoring and reporting apparatus already built into that proffer. So, you know, that's just a, this is a sort of a snapshot, but it's a really good place to go within, within the actual programmatic documents to see what you could do at a county level. Um, yeah, so it's all right here in the process. Thanks, Katie. Did you have anything else that you wanted to say before I take over? Um, nope. 
Mm, uh, I was in the process of turning it on to you or over okay. to you. So let me stop sharing and then it's all yours. <clears throat> that sounds good. And I, while Katie and Renee were presenting, I saw some folks with some interesting questions in, in the chat. Um, so we're going to be addressing those in a minute. I'll share my screen. Now go ahead and introduce yourself. Yep, I'm going to do that. Okay, slides up. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All right. So, uh, well, my name is Doug DeBerry, and uh, as Katie mentioned, um, I was a part of the development contract for the Pollinator Smart Program. <clears throat> that um, my participation on that contract was uh, through my role as a senior scientist at VHB, and um, I, I wanted to also mention that I am a, a professor at William and Mary of Environmental Science and Policy. And so my research programs at William & Mary actually sort of dovetail nicely with this the kind of content in this, this contract and um, what came out of it. We have a couple of projects that we're looking to get grants to, to fund some research um, in some of your counties, frankly, uh, some of the folks who introduced themselves. So we're excited about that and um, the potential to kind of get more data and to help uh, really compel the industry to move forward. Okay, I have a lot of material I want to go over and not a lot of time to do it. So I'm going to do a little bit of a speed round and I'm going to try to see if I can <clears throat> really kind of fit in between the category of uh, inform, uh, but a lot of folks already know the stuff. So we're going to try to really focus on the potential for the pollinator smart program to dovetail with a locality level program. The benefits that we're targeting, not just for like solar developers and for the state, but I'm thinking more along the lines of local governance. Uh, the, and then you can even say the general, general welfare of your citizens, your, your counties and cities. And of course, the obvious thing, the natural resources with the preservation and enhancement of those, so that's important. Um, and then I think we're gonna try to have a bit of a discussion with you about innovative ways that we can think to incorporate the program into your and see your, your counties and cities. So that's the idea. Um, starting with the, the concept of benefits, and of course for an ecologist like me, uh, the, the top of the heap is the ecosystem functions and services that pollinators are providing. Um, you can name any of these, of course. Th these are the things that people always hear about. So uh, biodiversity is important. The wildlife support functions, uh, you know, the potential for native plantings to reduce invasive species. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how that happens in a minute. Um, but then also the, the ancillary benefits of increasing the chances for things that are rare, threatened, or endangered to actually still occur out on the landscape in, a, in places where we, uh, we tend to have more monotypic growth patterns like turf grass and so forth. And then all the other, uh, the other corridor enhancement benefits, uh, soil enhancement, carbon sequestration, and then the food security support. So just to capture some of these things. If you think in terms of food webs, you know, pollinators are a great model for you because they are at the base of that food web. Um, everybody, if you can think back to your biology class, you learned about trophic pyramids and uh, pollinators are down at the, the bottom of that pyramid supporting all the, the life forms that come up above it. Um, you know, so these, these plant pollinator mutualisms are the, the keystone to a lot of these things and, you know, the majority of our flowering plants are pollinated by either insect pollinators or other life forms like uh, birds, bats, and so forth. So this is, that's an important, and that's probably a throwaway statement. Most, fo most folks kind of get that. They know that pollinators are important. They're in decline, so this is something that we should all be, we should all be really focused on and trying to do. Things that we might not also think about are that um, when you compare the, the, if you look at the images on the bottom here, you compare the picture on the, on the left here, this is a, you know, this is a product in Virginia where it's a post agricultural landscape and you see we have the weeds coming in and so forth. So if you have a native planting scheme, this image here, um, the potential for the biodiversity and for the core species that are in your, your seed mix, which we, we kind of define that as the, the species that are doing most of the work to preempt space and keep invaders out, that's a really, really important benefit. Uh, it's, a, it's a benefit not only from the ecology side of things, but there are other benefits related to this, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, kind of more cultural benefits. 
So um, the, the other obvious bit scenario here is that over here on the right hand side, as we are creating a habitat like this, we're also connecting a fragmented landscape. So you have uh, probably an agricultural landscape setting. Um, sometimes it's in an urban scenario where you have the potential to increase the opportunities for pollinators moving across these fragmented landscapes um, to get reasonable. So that's, that's um, again, okay, uh, thank you for indulging my ecology moment. Um, on the more pragmatic side, when we think of benefits, we also are thinking about uh, ENS benefits, um, erosion and sedimentation, of course, and stormwater benefits. Um, so when you, I'll show you in a minute, when you think about root systems of these plants, a lot of the forbs, and when I say forb, F-O-R-B, um, if you're not familiar with that term, all I really mean is kind of things that aren't grasses or grass-like plants. So wildflowers are forbs. You know, anything that's kind of like a, a broad-leaved herbaceous plant would be a forb. They have better root systems. They have deeper root systems. They're more intact. They are fibrous, so they, they hold the soil better versus your traditional turf grass management scenario. Um, and the, the landscape is, landscaping is resilient. I'll tell you what I mean by that in a second. Um, there are potential risks, of course, with any planting scheme, particularly in, in the temperate region, like a coastal habitat in the temperate region like Virginia, because this time of year, we're always kind of looking to the skies and saying, when's that next big hurricane coming? So native plantings actually reduce the potential risk of extreme environmental effects, which is great. And uh, increased runoff attenuation. So a little bit about that. Um, I borrowed the image at the top from Rob Davis at Fresh Energy. Um, as Katie mentioned, Fresh Energy was one of our teammates in this uh, program, and Rob was in, involved in the very early stages of that first scorecard system up in Minnesota, and he's been plugged into a lot of this along the way. I just love this graphic because if you look over here on the left-hand side, you see this is this is turf grass. This, this is your solar farm on turf grass, okay? And this shouldn't be a surprise to most, most folks, and especially not to an agronomist, let's say, because uh, we have a low growth form and the root structure is, is fairly tight at the surface, but we don't really get that deep root penetration that you would normally do from plants that are tuned in to the local environment, these native species, these really strong root structures, they're holding the soil, they're binding it together. So there are these, there are these really uh, great synergistic ENS benefits to using native species. Um, so why aren't we doing it? And then we'll talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> um, other things that we have found out, uh, research has shown that using kind of native meadow type species actually reduces runoff to the tune of about 30%. So you're, um, you know, you get, you get basically uh, runoff uh, attenuation or stormwater attenuation um, from the native planting. That's pretty important. Uh, the bottom right-hand picture, that's an image that, uh, it's a project that Katie and I worked on together. Um, that, this is what happens. Then this, this was a, a, at the finished level, a product that was constructed and planted with uh, con contractor grade fescue. And of course the planting miscarried because we had a, a section of the site that was wetter than other areas. If you had a more diverse planting scheme with a broader plant palette, there's the potential, a high potential frankly, that a lot of the species that you plant here would be able to survive a condition like this in the short term at least. Um, when you have a wetter condition or an extreme environmental scenario, like a really, really, really wet spring. Okay, so uh, the benefits obviously related to that. I also want to mention some of the economic benefits, and I'm thinking, of course, uh, at, at, in the first instance of economic benefits for builders and owners and operators of utility sale, scale solar, but uh, there are also benefits that can be experienced at more of a locality level like uh, potential for revenue generation. And I'll mention what, what I mean by that in a second. And then of course, there is the sort of intangible benefit of having a healthy pollinator community supporting row crops in agricultural commodity scenarios. Um, a lot of our Virginia localities were seeing these solar facilities popping up right next to agricultural, active agricultural landscapes. It's probably one of the best places to put these facilities but that means that you know we're basically taking out uh, the, some potential if we don't provide this provision, if you will, for pollinator support. Um, 
and of course the you know the slides I could have showed you this this is your supermarket on pollinators and this is your supermarket off of pollinators it's uh, some ridiculous amount of our um, all our produce and our products like our natural products in the supermarket depend on pollinators you know super important and then um, we've also learned some things about energy generation efficiencies so I'll just mention those if you look at the top Again, here's our image on the left-hand side. Both of these facilities, left and right, are at the exact same stage in their first in their first growing season after construction. And you can see the this is post-agricultural. This is a site on the left that was treated with the typical fescue turf intake. But what did come in is the seed bank and the post-agricultural landscape. You're going to get your weedy species because it's the it's like the perfect storm scenario. It's a it's a high resource field, lots of, you know, um, fertilizer and so forth, and it's disturbed. So it's, you know, if you're a weed, it's where you want to be, okay? But over here on the right-hand side, we have basically the same type of scenario, but the difference is there was a, the pollinator support program was used, um, sorry, the pollinator uh, smart program was used on that right-hand side. So um, the economic benefit, the potential economic benefit here is, again, we're, we're seeing that connection to ag agriculture support in our localities, and that means that um, you know we're providing that that benefit for um, the farmers in our you know in our counties and cities, who um, you know who are depending on that for livelihood and also for um, food security. But we've also found out some interesting stuff. If you plant forbs, so these kind of broadleaf plants underneath these panels or near them, the transpiration that comes off the plant. Then the humidity, like the, the local humidity environment, actually cools the panel. And um, there's been some research that's done been done on this out in the kind of the Midwest area. But um, it, it it actually increases the the energy generation efficiency of the panel to the tune of um, a couple of cents per megawatt over the protracted period of of the operation of the facility. But it can mean you know thousands and thousands of dollars of savings to not only the facility managers, but also the ratepayers, and those ratepayers are right there in your counties and cities. So, you know, we're seeing benefits, um, potential economic benefits that people weren't even thinking about uh, before, before a lot of this stuff, this kind of the, the pollinator plus solar concept um, of co-location became um, an important idea. <clears throat> and the last thing I'll mention down here at the bottom, Katie already talked about the business plan that was produced for the Pollinator Smart Program. This was a, um, I don't want to dwell on it, but it was in a very, very important aspect of the program was to come up with a, a way to really develop a Virginia native seed industry. And uh, that's kind of getting some, getting some momentum. So what we're hoping for is participants and, for example, farmers who are in your counties and your, your localities, um, uh, buying into this program, and this is a you know this is a multi-million dollar industry right now in the Mid Atlantic, and there are only a couple of folks in the game. So we see this as another potential economic boon for localities. Um, and you know, if you are if there's the potential that you can adopt some of these programs or encourage them in your locality, you're just stimulating more and more of this type of thing down the line. So that's an economic boon. Okay. Um, the last one I want to finish with is just the kind of the community benefits and all I really say about that is that um, You know, if you think about a typical solar project, you guys are reviewing these things um, probably for you know, environmental due diligence and so forth or other reasons, you know that in the decision stream for construction of one of these facilities. There are all kinds of players and stakeholders. You obviously have the developer we got the owner and operator if they're if they're not the same. There's the there's the large utility infrastructure, so like the dominions um, and so forth that are that are important along the line. And there's you, um, but let's face it, with all those people involved, you know when you get an angry landowner who wants to call somebody and complain about the solar farm that is being approved for you know, their beautiful farm across their street, across the street from where they live, who are they going to call? They're going to call you. They call the county and they complain to you guys. So the community part of this, you know, the, where it benefits you is there are obviously a lot of uh, really incredible opportunities for advocacy and education, you know, getting, getting your residents and your localities to understand all these benefits that we've been talking about. 
but then there's just the, the blatant aesthetic benefit. You know, if you put a solar farm up and, and you throw turf grass or gravel under it, that's, that presents a different aesthetic than wildflowers and pollinators. So, you know, the, the public relations part of this is really something that um, we, you know, we underscore when we're thinking about this because <clears throat> it's the part of it that I think that the developers and the construction managers and so forth are also kind of cluing into the fact that they that there's this kind of neighbor, um, you know, good neighbor aspect of this and stewardship component, which is very important. Um, and, I, and I'll, um, this is probably a little tangential, but you know, the, the potential for carbon sequestration goes way up when we're using native species and, and uh, complex plantings like this. And so we all have to think about this and we, it's all part of our programs now, you know, we're in a, we're in kind of a carbon economy and uh, we're trying to get away from it. And so there are some interesting synergies here, even at the locality level. Um, with with the uh, with um, kind of climate change and so forth too. So those are some things that we're thinking about. Okay, um, I want to take a, a brief minute. I've got a couple minutes left to talk about. Um, first of all, can can we even think about pollinator smart in the context of some local environmental condition or regulation? And this little kind of quote, which is a paraphrase of of what we've been hearing from most of the solar developers, is is really common. I mean, it was probably, probably the most common thing that was said at the stakeholder meeting that Katie mentioned that we had last year. Um, so it goes like this, we want to actually implement these practices on our projects, but we're getting pushback from the localities because of some reason, because our seed mix doesn't meet the you know, specifications of their ordinance, because we don't have a, you know, we have a height restriction on the plants, this application, and we can't meet it, these types of things. Common, the common pushback we've been getting from, from the developers. Um, and so our response to that, and really what we want to ask you about in the discussion component of this is, um, you know, we believe that the revegetation practices that are in this, the program, that 127 page document that Katie showed you, the conference manual, we think that if, if a developer will follow those practices that Anything that they do will be compliant with, and this is the key thing, the goals and objectives of your local um, ENS and stormwater regs, really because of the benefits of the, the process itself, which is um, kind of goes by the general term integrated vegetation management. So I want to tell you why I, I think that's the case, and I'll give you a little bit of background on what IVM actually is. Okay. So we have a, if, if you really wanted a more in-depth review, there's a really good summary chapter on this in the conference manual. Um, this is a lot of uh, research that I had done. So for all you raging insomniacs, this is my writing. It'll, it'll be the cure for what ails you. But if you were interested in trying to get a really good overview of integrated vegetation management, this is a good place to start. Um, now, IBM is really, focused on promoting low growing, mostly herbaceous plant communities that are, are gonna resist invasion. And it started out as invasion by trees for like power lines, but it sort of morphed into this idea of really resisting invasion of anything that's undesirable. So that meets you know, a lot of uh, state interests because invasive species are problematic and so forth. <clears throat> but we, um, we have these other ideas or goals, which is, appropriate, meaning plants that are native to the area, environmentally sound, meaning we have a sustainable community, and cost-effective, meaning we don't want to blow the bank just to do something different, right? And, and that's where a lot of the questions came up too. How is, the, you know, what's the cost of all this? Can we do it? It turns out we're not focused on that because we're picking in the county, but if you, if the county wanted to spend money on this, they could actually save money in the long run over the lifespan of a project because we're seeing a uh, return on investment um, of around five to seven years for a project, sometimes earlier, just be just by taking the amount of mowing that you have to do on an annual basis out of the management regime. So that's pretty important. Um, another tenet of IVM is that it's a treatment that minimizes its own use over time. And the goal there is that um, in year one, you might have to go out and, and uh, do some herbicide applications or some other types of controls, um, mechanical removal of invasives or, or not just weeds. But in year two, you have a fraction of that uh, effort that is gonna be required. And then by year three, four, five, 
you've got a sustainable community that maybe only requires a dormant season though. So that's the goal. And we've seen it, we've seen it in, in some habitats that you would not believe you could pull this off in like downtown DC, we pulled this off, so it, it, it works. Um, so, you know, that little flow chart at the bottom is a simplistic viewpoint of how this, how this uh, plays out. And the key thing for adaptive management, this is important for the counties to hear and the cities, because a lot of times in, the, in a permit process or an environmental review process, you know, you have conditions that are um, stipulated in a permit and conditions are written often in a way that really doesn't allow much latitude to change over time. So really to, to adopt an integrated vegetation management approach, the regulatory apparatus has to allow change to occur in the management regime based on the feedback you're getting from monitoring. That's very, very important. And it's something that, again, was really hard to kind of to push forward in the late 90s, early 2000s, but we're starting to see it become more and more common in our, in our regulatory programs. For example, um, Renee mentioned the, the uh, interagency review team for the IRT for wetland and stream mitigation in Virginia has this adaptive management concept built into its, its guidance. Okay, this is really a busy slide, and all I want you to do is understand that uh, well, first of all, this is the research I do at William & Mary, so I had to put it up there. But, you know, this stuff actually works. And the reason why it works is because it taps into plant ecology that's, that sort of drives, <clears throat> it sort of drives the interplay between dominant species that become problematic and high diversities of species, or you might even just say high richness of species. So, yeah, I don't, I'm not going to explain the de details of all the science here, but just know that we're, we have uh, two concepts, stress and disturbance. They're two different ideas. They both relate to how plants can live on a habitat type. And IVM, it really splits the difference between those and max maximizes the benefits for, um, for plant diversity and for pollinators. Okay, well, um, so just from an implementation, imp implementation standpoint, I would say that um, if you, at the county level, <clears throat> are interested in adopting something that relates to this program again what i would say is that if you had a developer come in who said they were going to do a vegetation management plan based on the the, the concepts that are explained in the vet, the pollinator smart program particularly in the comprehensive manual they're going to develop a vegetation management plan they're going to follow the installation procedures they're going to go through the site su suitability analysis and they're going to find out all kinds of interesting things about the site then I would feel fairly confident that you could accommodate any goals and objectives of any environmental review for your county, for your city. Okay, so if that is a true statement um, and you take that to be true, then what we wanna do is talk to you now about ways that this particular program with all these benefits could actually be incorporated into your programs at the locality level. And I'll just, you know, these are outlines of some ideas. Um, I am not a, a, an engineer, a stormwater engineer or a planner. So I don't typically run plans through uh, environmental review at county level or city level. Um, but um, I have been involved in site plan review, at least in different ways. For example, in developing species mixes and so forth. And so our, our thinking is that um, at the top of the, the desirable level for the program, you can encode this into ordinance. Um, in the, I would say that's probably a challenging thing because you have, uh, you know, you have um, decisions that are, that are being made at the at the level of county supervisors and so forth. <clears throat> so if that's not feasible, then my thought is that the site plan review process, there are potentially ways that you can plug in the Virginia Pollinator Smart Program. For example, in the uh, the SMP permit review, um, there is the potential, I think, to uh, to consider to consider if you are requiring um, stormwater management uh, attenuation on a project site for a solar uh, facility, that you could consider the the native plantings as a BMP in and of itself. Um, I don't know what's involved in that. It might involve um, including some runoff reduction coefficient within the spreadsheets that are used for that. But there's a potential there that that could, it's a, you know, potentially plug it in. Another thing is that um, for your land disturbance permits, 
for the ENS. Um, I'm asking you, is there a way to streamline the review process for um, a developer that wants to come in and build a facility using Pollinator Spark? Um, in other words, does the, can the box be checked if they are going to follow all these, these procedures and make sure that the site is implemented in that way? And I hear you saying, well, wait a second now, what happens if the site is finished, if construction is, is done in November? Like, what do you do then? Because you're going to put the, put the native seeds out there, but they're not going to germinate until March, April, May. And the reality is that in the implementation sequence that we described, there is always the potential, and, and usually the potential, frankly, for a cover crop to be used in concert with native plantings. So that cover crop would provide you your temporary seeding plan, and then you would have the permanent seeding plan in your um, in your zoning review, sorry, in your um, ENS review with the Pollinator Smart Program. So that's an idea. Um, another thing would be in your special use or conditional use permits for a facility, if you're having to change zoning, um, is there a way to proffer use of uh, Pollinator Smart techniques? And um, in those proffers, again, like I said before, the, the benefit of this program is that it's already spelled out in the program. So at, at the locality level, you're not having to create your own language, if you will, in the permit conditions for inspection, site inspections and everything, it's already built in. So if, you, know, you could say if the if a, a proffer component of this is that, the, um, the Pollinator Smart facility is going to remain compliant with the Virginia Pollinator Smart program. Using the scorecards is helpful. Uh, and in the back of my mind, I also have that uh, you guys, you localities have a TMDL requirement for, for your impaired waters. And again, the thought there is that if there are potentially potential opportunities for um, Pollinator Smart plant to serve as PMPs to uh, reduce the, um, the potential for or to, to kind of benefit these, those watersheds or those sub-watersheds that are under a TMDL, then, um, then there's a benefit that's, that's related there and that, that's a way to kind of encode the, the system. So I guess we want to open it up for, to you guys for other ideas and I'll just finish with this slide, which is, you know, uh, we are talking about solar today, but as Renee mentioned, there are all kinds of other applications. And, you know, if you go to other states like Iowa, which is very, very well advanced in its native seed industry and its programs. <clears throat> We're looking at transportation corridors, different localities, um, you know, e even small roadways like county roadways and, and so forth, potential to, to do this type of planting or, or application there. It's really beneficial in those situations because, you know, you have site, site lines and so forth that need to be maintained. But there are also uh, green spaces and development plans, obviously utility corridors, which fit in any kind of these, these sort of like buffer areas where you have, um, you know, a type of land use like an, like an athletic field. Um, you might be able to kind of use a, a small buffer strip or planting strip as a BMP and also an aesthetic benefit. I see Linda, are you calling it? Sure, uh, you can okay. help me. So okay. everyone out there, so we started with a few questions in the chat. And maybe you want to talk about some of those first? Okay, Seth? yeah, sure. Um, let me, I guess I need to stop sharing because I can't see the, we stopped sharing there. Okay, good. Yeah, so I had uh, one question was, um, let's see, what was it? Oh, uh, the question from Michelle Edwards was, can localities legally require utility scale solar projects to get the certification in the local solar ordinance? Um, I, I don't know how to answer that. I think that's up to the locality. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fairly confident it's up to the locality that whether they want to put that in the ordinance. And my guess is that that's not going to be the case. Has anyone, I, has anyone worked on that who's on this phone call? What do you think about that? Um, well, in the meantime, uh, I just wanted to chime in and say that the city of Chesapeake did uh, include uh, the scorecard as part of their um, <clears throat> ordinance, their solar ordinance. Um, one idea uh, to kind of is, is uh, to just say that um, a developer needs to submit the scorecard, not necessarily pass it. Um, and that is one way uh, to encourage the Pollinator Smart Program without actually um, making it 
uh, so that they, uh, you know, ha have to pass uh, the scorecard. Um, you know, a lot of people aren't going to want to fill out a scorecard and have a score of zero or 20. You know, it just doesn't look good. Um, so that's one way to get to get interest and to also um, at least get people thinking about the program. Great. Anyone else? Has anybody else thought about that or have questions about that? How to make it so that you can have your pollinator smart program scorecard really be part of the ordinance and part of what's used in your locality? Um, this is Beth Major. I think the, another aspect that the localities can look at is requirements within their conditional use or their special use permits. Mm -hmm. um, we know we know of some localities that have made these requirements part of their their permitting uh, requirements, and um, that's certainly an option. Great. Has anybody is there anybody else on who's done something like that? This is Monica Elder with Charlotte County. We have approved three projects and we did not use this specific program, but the individuals identified the use of native plants and working with DEQ or DCR, either one to identify those mixtures. How would we migrate from something like that to using a more formulated program like this? Great question. Um, so Monica, I'll, I'll just chime in and say, uh, while not having any, any um, <clears throat> I guess, legitimate background in, in local governance, what I'm going to say is pretty much what I learned from working with engineers and, and, and folks like you and your programs. But um, my thought is that uh, it would be, you know, probably most beneficial instead of making it compulsory to actually include it as an option for for developers but the way that you incentivize it is the is the part that i have a question about so like i would say if, if i were a, at a, a county level that you know that I, I was able to make decisions like this um we could we could say as part of an sup that we you know one of the proffers is is you know to use a kind of a native kind of planting scheme uh and that we would streamline the review process if if you follow the Virginia Pollinator Smart program. And the reason why I say that is because as I mentioned before, it's all there. You know, the program is already built by the state and it's accessible to everyone. And as Katie mentioned earlier, it's also consistent with other states' programs. So it's not like when you move into Virginia as a solar developer, you are experiencing something completely off the mark from anything you've done yet. And so that's my thought is that, you know, if it, instead of making it compulsory, if you made it um, an option for developers um, at, the, at the level of, you know, county ordinance, then you could, you could basically encode this particular program or the current, you know, the most current version of the Virginia um, Pollinator Smart Program. So if these developers have already indicated because th these are some of these are applications that have been approved that they are going to work with DCR on identifying native species and that's part of their land management plan. How would DCR work with them at this point? I mean, they have not agreed and we've already approved the conditions associated with the application. So at this point, you know, how do you all work with them? Is it something you would encourage them maybe to look at this program or do you just help them identify the seed mix they need to move forward? So this is Renee Hypes with DCR. I think at this point it would be interesting for them to take a look at the scorecard and see how what they've already proposed um, kind of fits into the program already. And then we certainly are open to, you know, talking with them about seed mixes, but maybe some other things that they might be able to incorporate or have already incorporated. Um, so that would, I think, be the next step is to have them go ahead and take a look at the program, potentially uh, fill out a scorecard, and uh, certainly they can reach out to us and we can talk to them more about what they're planning to do. Okay, thank you. Great. Any other comments about 
that topic, getting things going in terms of your ordinances. So Doug, there was one other question that was in the chat earlier, and that was just about the scale that we should be considering. So um, is this residential solar installations or is it something much larger? Do you want to comment about that? Yeah, sure. I think um, the answer to that question is that <clears throat> the program is was built around really any scale of solar application, but the, the concept was uh, sort of um, pitched towards utility scale solar. But my thought is that at the county level, any project that requires a site plan review and approval, this could be implemented. And it could be implemented, especially using these techniques that we talked about or these, these different approaches. So again, if you had a special use permit that was required for a zoning change in the proffers, you could kind of make the component of the, the permit review process is my thought. Yeah, um, I just wanted to also chime in and say, um, you know, the scorecards are designed um, to try to fit basically any type of project that you would encounter across the state. Um, so there's a lot of latitude in the scorecard. Um, that's why we talk about uh, percent cover um, in the different zones um, to help work with uh, sites where some things may not be feasible over others. Um, that's why on the scorecard there's a, a minimum of 10% of the site could be planted um, to help accommodate for facilities where the footprint is so large that planting with native species uh, across the whole site uh, might not even be financially feasible. Um, so the, the way that we've designed this, um, it can really fit with, with anything. That's, that's the point of um, some of the behind a lot of the scorecard questions. Great. So there's another comment in here from Anne. This is a wonderful one. So would someone from the presenting group be willing to speak to a PC slash BOS? to discuss the Board of Supervisors, to discuss the benefits of the program so that the Board of Supervisors would be willing to add this additional regulation. Ideally, the state should mandate it since they allow all the tax incentives. Our locality is opposed to additional regulations in general, but if they see the benefits, they may, may be willing to do it. So Renee and Sharon and Doug, do you wanna talk about that? Uh, well, I'll, I'll start off. Um, so willingness to speak, absolutely. Um, you know, let's, let's, we see that as kind of part of our um, commitment to this program. And we relish the opportunity to go speak to the, these, uh, you know, these, these governing bodies. <clears throat> the question about the, you know, the tax incentive one is not one that I really can answer. You know, I think that you're looking at an increase in tax base for us, you know, when these solar facilities come in. So there does seem to me to be some potential opportunity there. Um, and uh, there's also, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about the incentives for the, the developer. Like if, if they choose this particular route, would they get some tax, tax benefit with the county? Again, that's a decision that can be made there, but there's def definitely some leverage, I think, to, to incentivize folks to do it, you know, to, to, to take that tax. And other this folks? is, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Doug. No, oh, I was just, I was just calling on other folks to, to speak, so. Yeah, go ahead, Renee. Sure. So this is Renee Hypes with DCR. Uh, this question's come up before about tax incentives and from a land conservation perspective. And certainly we've reached out to our land conservation office around this. Uh, currently there's no guidance um, in place on whether some of this could be looked at as kind of a land conservation component. It certainly would have to meet all the criteria um, that's um, put in place for those tax incentives, uh, but it is something that we are talking about internally um, and certainly can get you in touch with someone in our land conservation office to talk more about this. But currently we don't have any guidance in place regarding tax incentives from a land conservation perspective in terms of pollinator habitat, but it is an ongoing discussion. Anyone else? Um, this is Sharon. I guess I would only add that, um, you know, DEQ permits these 
facilities, but um, the Department of Mines, Minerals, and Energy is uh, the ones overseeing kind of general energy policy in the Virginia Energy Plan, and they actually have a, a relatively um, new staff position um, there. And the the woman who Carrie Hearn, who has the job, it is her, she's like in charge of solar and you know encouraging solar. And she has come to some of our stakeholder meetings, but um, you know we this phase of the project was um, just finalizing all the tools that Doug and, and Katie just went through. But, you know, maybe now is the time for a discussion among state agencies on, on some of these uh, issues that are being raised, like how best to address them. Great idea. Yeah. So more discussion and more things may evolve over the next year, right? Mm -hmm. Um, there was another question, this was from Donna, and that's, um, we sort of touched on it, but let's talk about it a little further. So streamline review incentives could be a possibility. So someone could get their permit applications through more quickly, for instance. Let's talk about that. And then any other incentive suggestions that would help to have this program utilized. Yeah, and I would just caveat that question by saying if um, <clears throat> if we have the, the folks from the county who are on who are reviewing site plans for you know environmental due diligence at the county level, uh, how much scrutiny is put into review of the planting plans now? And if you're looking at like a permanent seeding mix that was was meant to be compliant with the Virginia Erosion and uh, Sediment Control Manual. Um, what, you know, it, is there a potential to, again, like I said, st streamline the process. So if you got a, if you got a site plan in that had the, this type of program, in other words, a, a well-documented application of IVM and, and using the Virginia Pollinator Smart uh, procedures or practices, could that then be streamlined? Could you just say that's, they're doing it, so we're checking the box. Yes, this is approved. I mean, is there a difference? I mean, is there a benefit there? So there's another a comment from Ann relating into this. The state provides a lot of tax incentives for solar, although it is a minor increase in revenues for the locality if the property was agriculturally zoned, but not necessarily for residentially zoned property. They also don't generate much need for services, but not a big economic generator. Hmm. Anyone have anything to add to that from your locality or your experience? This is Ann. I, I just want to explain that a little more, but um, in the you know, peninsula and the rural localities, they actually, um, the state recently passed legislation to allow um, localities to um, enter into revenue sharing agreements and site negotiations, and um, especially in opportunity zones. And the idea is that these um, solar facilities are going into a lot of rural areas and, you know, as it is now, we don't have a lot of tax generation. We're mostly bedroom communities. And so to try to give the locality an opportunity to get some revenues out of these um, land uses that are continually taking over. So I, again, I would just wonder if, you know, localities hate to um, put additional regulations on development, but if, you know, the state could provide the incentive for something like this, I think it would, would be great. We do try to get it through the CUP process, but a lot of that's voluntary. And again, our our current government body is not that into uh, environmental um, things anyway. So um, just some thoughts out there, but again, they're really not big uh, economic benefits to localities and they take up a lot of land. So, um, you know, not not everyone thinks they're good for the county. This is Renee from DCR, and I hear you on that aspect, but thinking maybe outside the box, and we've seen this in other states as they're a little bit further along in solar development than we are, that maybe coming up with partnerships, that having um, beehives on some of these sites and having honey produced and having um, a brewery associated I wonder if there's ways to think about that in terms of economic development beyond the solar farm, but making that connection basically in a community way 
with maybe somehow connecting the solar farm and, and production there with um, some other business or some other entity that would allow for growth in that regard. Anyone else want to comment or discuss within this topic? Yeah, this is Beth Major with DEQ. Um, we at the state level are very aware of the concerns for permitting and how some of this should be addressed at the state level. The problem is that our statutory authority is very, very specific for this permitting program. Um, the, the statutory law is in fact a permit by rule and is very specific about what um, by law we can evaluate in this permitting program. Virginia being a Dillon state rule has always left citing issues and citing authority uh, to the local level. So the state can't come in and say, well, we deem this area to be a good site for a solar farm. So regardless of whether the locality wants it or not, we're gonna stick it here. That's, that's not how we work in Virginia. So unfortunately, the locality um, does bear the responsibility for siting and or positively I mean one could look at that and say well we can we can dictate what we do and don't want within our local jurisdiction and we have had a number of localities refuse and deny um, that conditional use permits for proposed solar farms um, but at the state level our statutory authority to control what goes in these permits is extremely limited. And the, so that puts more of a responsibility on the locality. And the General Assembly, of course, sets that public policy. And therefore, uh, the tax incentives, what should or should not be mandated, of course, is a determination made um, through the General Assembly. And that's that's always a uh, that's always a difficult road to hoe when trying to get um, specific legislation passed. So the, along along these lines, and then shifting a little bit, let's talk a, about a few other comments in here. And that is, Donna had asked, can someone expand on the maintenance requirements and expectations? So that's a different topic. Doug, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah, I can try to uh, frame it. Uh, actually, uh, what I might do is bring up another set of slides if uh, everyone would, would indulge another 90 second review. It'd probably be most helpful to see it. Looks good. Okay, good. Well, this is not a solar facility. This is actually a, a project on a, a brownfield site, but the, the techniques are the same. And if you look at the trajectory, this is uh, basically year one. So um, early growing season, the site gets a, a full mow kind of a low mode condition to remove any any um, above ground biomass <clears throat> and that's the mode condition in mid-march um, the project this particular project had a lot of invasives so there had to be a, a non-selective herbicide application to basically kill most of what was there and that may be the case and, and this, so that might be a part of the of the maintenance requirement in year one is in the in the vegetation analysis that we do in the beginning, if you determine that there's a high risk for invasion, or there, you know, the the ag field where the facility is being being installed has a lot of species that are problematic, um, this may be part of it. And a lot of our contractors now have have um, machines that can fit up and down the panel rows and everything. And then this is um, <clears throat> this is a seed drill that's been modified for native species. And we really recommend drilling. Um, if you don't know what is involved there, it actually just kind of like punches the soil into the ground rather than till it. And that's ob obviously a benefit because then you don't have to worry about land disturbance um, because uh, seed drilling is not a land disturbance activity. Um, so this is a, basically the seeding process. And then, um, then there's uh, a, quite a bit of maintenance on the, on, on the front end to make sure that you're, you're being vigilant about the species that are moving in. So, uh, and then this is, you know, you might have some bare ground areas that need to be mulched or, um, you know, uh, aerated in, as, in this case is what we used. <clears throat> but the results were, were pretty staggering. And um, this is an example of the year one results that we did the plot-based analysis. Um, almost, you know, 90, 80% of the species were native and that's the relative cover. So that's 
you know, the bulk of what's out there on the site. Almost 100% cover of plants. And then in year two, with using adaptive management, there was some spot treating and, and we had to remove some trees on this site, but um, that's just, that was just a part of it. And then by the end of year two, again, the results were really good. So um, let me just get through these little vistas. Uh, this is a, a slide that Renee just showed you an example, but um, this is the Copal site. Again, we have gear that can go up and down these inner panel rows now. So it can be, you know, it, it does require some specialized gear. And so you can't just work with any management contractor to do this stuff. But um, a lot of the, the folks who are in the kind of revegetation game have outfitted their, their uh, staff with this type of equipment. Um, and then there's that site there. So it's, it's more expensive, obviously. Um, these are just some costs that we had, but about 5,000 per acre for this site, um, but that's not um, translatable to a, a hundred or a thousand acre site because there's economy of scale. So, you know, this number would not be, you know, you wouldn't be spending that much money on a hundred acre site. You probably, you would ratchet down quite a bit. Um, and the money, the capital outlay goes down per year. So in this case, IBM worked because it's reducing its own use over time. A better way to look at this is some, some numbers that, um, were presented by Rob Davis at Fresh Energy, but over the uh, modeling a 20 year facility, um, they found something on the order of three times uh, less money spent on uh, pollinator habitat versus grass. And that was just in the mowing and maintenance parts of it. So by year three, in answer to your question, by year three, four or five, um, you're looking at pretty much just some really low, um, low energy um, surveillance on the site, and then maybe a dormant season mow, just to keep things down. And then there have been people that have looked at the potential for rotation of grazing on these sites. So um, there's, there are modern day shepherds actually being put out into these facilities and they're being managed in that way. So that's just an interesting way to kind of continue to think about that. Um, graphic that we have in the, in the uh, manual is this one here. This was an actual research project up in the Midwest but they had a return on investment for a native restoration, meta restoration versus a mowed lawn of about three years using native seeds. So hopefully that gets you an idea of the maintenance. Stop sharing. Anybody have questions about maintenance or comments about maintenance? Has that been something, has maintenance been a topic that has come up for any of you when you're talking about utilities or those who would use this process? Hi, this is Donna. Can y'all hear me? We can. Okay, so um, one of our biggest, um, in Hanover County, one of our biggest issues is um, long-term maintenance. Um, when sites are have um, owners that change over periods of time, um, we, we, haven't, we haven't implemented any kind of um, programs for the pollinators, but we do have programs for our sustainability and in BMPs and things like that. Um, and one of our one of our biggest issues is how do we trans you know we have a, a maintenance agreements and contracts with the original site plan um, application, but when that, that site is sold or just change, changes owners or changes businesses, however the the, the site layout is still the same the new owner doesn't know or, or, or have any kind of um, knowledge for maintaining what, what practices have been put into that, that site. So that's one of the challenges I think that we would also come into with, with, with these kinds of a pollinator sites, whether it's a solar site or a brownfield or even just um, accenting parking lot islands. Yeah. I'd say just an answer to that, Donna, I would say that um, at, at least in the case of the solar facilities, if you had a transition of ownership, um, well, I don't know um, how frequently that happens. Um, I suspect it, it, it could happen, but in most cases, I think what we're seeing is that the owner operator is like a dominion, you know, so they're going to have the, they're going to have the ownership of that for the life of the project. But in the case of solar, I think that the owners, whoever they are, if they change 
are going to be motivated to maintain the vegetation because if they don't, obviously there's going to be a compromise of the, the, the panels. I mean, the plants will grow up and then they won't be able to, they're going to shade the panels and so forth. So I think there's a vested interest in, on the, in, in the um, case of the owners to, um, to maintain the vegetation. On, this, on the education part of it, or the, the part where the new owner is beholden to some requirement, I'm not really sure how, how that goes. I would assume that um, if if there's a transition of ownership, if there's a if it's a proctor or a condition under an SUP, um, that that the new owner ha you know has to abide by that, you know according to your code, of your ordinance. But you're just saying that you have that. It just doesn't happen, I guess. We, there's there's the original agreement to. Um, implement the proper practice in place for commercial sites for, and I'm thinking of things like biosustainable um, areas with specific planting, mm. but, and, but there's nothing to translate that unless it's in an easement, there's nothing to translate that into the next owner. Um, it could be a, a private BMP that just serves that site and therefore it wouldn't be something that has a maintenance agreement with with the county um, for for many for many sites. Yeah. We do also have residential um, uses for the solar panels. In fact, I see more of those lately. Um, Hanover is a very uh, rural county. We have lots of rural areas, lots of farmlands, and lots of large lots where folks are approached to add panels, whether it be ten or a hundred panels. Um, now, if there's some incentives in place or some reason that they would use this pollinator program, even if it's just something that they want to do, um, if that residence was sold, there's there's nothing to re regulate maintaining that facility yeah. on, a, on a residential property. Yeah. Anyone else on that topic? Um, I want to just mention what Anne had put into the chat here that uh, her thought is that the General Assembly should mandate it, you know, mandate the requirements. They mandated living shorelines as a requirement to be considered first before other shoreline measures are taken. They mandated the Chesapeake Bay Act. They could mandate something like this, and then it would be the same for all localities. Anyone want to comment about that? That would be a cool thing. If I, if I could add to that, um, they also mandated that um, localities require a decommissioning surety and for these solar facilities. So that does kind of go to the maintenance um, because at the end of the life of the um, facility, they have to clean it up and theoretically restore it back to its original form. Um, and there's a big debate about whether that's actually possible or not. But um, so again, I just, you know, I don't, I know that DEQ is limited what they can require, but it, you know, they are, um, they pass like four different solar, uh, legislative updates this past uh, General Assembly. So I think really if you lobby the General Assembly and even the um, the solar industry, they realize that localities are starting to kind of push back. And so they are willing to do a lot more than um, previously. And so if they really understood the benefits to them of um, putting in uh, um, native plants and pollinators that, you know, they, you know, and the benefits for long-term maintenance, they might be more than happy to support legislation that requires it. So thinking about everything we've just talked about today, because well, we have about 13 minutes left or so, is there anything else that you can think of you want to ask questions about that would help you to be able to utilize the Pollinator Smart Program? And I will ask, go ahead, if you want to think of any sort of questions, anything at all that you want to talk about, please do. And I'll also tell you that we are going to, before we do close today, I'll ask for each one of you online to be able to give a comment and it could be in the chat window if you can't speak or by microphone if you can't speak, to talk about any particular action that you think you could take within your local community to be able to help make this program work there. So any, any one action that you might be able to take that you learned today or that you're thinking of to help bring this forward. So knowing that, are there any questions or anything else you can think of that would be helpful to you? Okay, so let's do this. Let's go around and let's just talk about 
you know, tell us what is there one action item you can take that would help make this happen for your community? Um, anyone want to go first? Now that I have a website to go to or like information, I think when we're discussing um, a project with an applicant through the conditional use permit process, we'll recommend that they, um, you know, that they make this a condition, you know, try to recommend it at the staff level. Um, again, they, if they choose not to, I don't know if our board would require it at the board level, but at least bring it up early on. And again, most of the people we've been talking to want to do whatever to make the county happy. So I, I, it's worth bringing it up and seeing if they're willing to commit to it. Great. Thank you, Ann. Who's next? This is Monica with Charlotte County. We're currently reviewing an application and they have indicated an intent to use um, native species and also to work with DCR on that. So I will bring this information to the Planning Commission at their next meeting and see if maybe they want to make the use of this program actually a condition for the permit that they're considering. Um, and then we may also look at the ones that we have approved that have not been constructed or are looking at working with DCR on the native species um, as well and see if they might be interested in pursuing the program. That's great, Monica. Thanks. And I know there, I think there might be a few of you who didn't even have a chance to introduce yourself in the beginning, but feel free to talk, just unmute yourself and let us know what you're thinking about what you might be able to do, what action you could take. And this is Donna again. Um, I think for Hanover County, the best way to implement this currently, or the most, the most, with the most possibility, would be through the special exception or conditional use permit processes. Um, it it is it is really great to have the whole program lined out with application and certificates. Um, that would that would be very much something we could reference um, in a condition in a condition of one of those processes. For us to implement it into anything that is um, a, a site that is already by right that doesn't have processes that it needs to go through that needs to be approved by the board or planning commission, uh, it would it would probably be something that we could encourage through some kind of incentive. Um, and then at the same time, we do have some incentives for natives in our ordinance. We might be able to implement uh, some of this practice um, and with, and with our public works department also with regards to the EQ and ENS requirements for Virginia. Great. And just to add to that, um, so that's great intel, uh, Donna, and what we would say to that is that if, if um, you get to the point where you're looking for, um, you know, just some review of potential conditions that you might put on a, an SUP or a CUP, uh, you can certainly bounce those ideas off of this team. Um, in particular, just to make sure that the verbiage is specific to the to the pro, the program and the process that is is sort of in in the um, uh, the framework that's been provided here. So. Doug, do you want to talk a little bit about um, previous language, previous legal language, and for lack of a better word, being stuck with that language versus what maybe you want now? Um, well, Katie might have a better um, opinion on that, but a, a one example is um, there's one locality that, that actually is referencing the pollinator smart in you know, the Virginia scorecard. But the issue is that it was, um, it was a draft version of the scorecard that was specifically referenced in their ordinance. And so they're kind of, you know, kind of stuck with that. Um, and the, and it's not so much that, that the concept of the scorecard is the problem. It's that the, the, the value, like the point value, was different <clears throat> with the old one versus the new one because we changed the metrics. So <laughs> we would say then to do to deal with that, the best approach would be to reference the most current version of the Virginia Pollinator Scorecard, card, um, either for um, you know planned or retrofit facilities or for um, existing facilities, something like that. Yeah, um, just to jump in. Um, yeah, so the, the issue was that uh, our point system changed as uh, we got deeper into the project. Um, so saying, you know, that you need a hundred and, you know, a facility must submit a scorecard with, 
you know, over 130 points or something specific like that um, doesn't really leave a lot of latitude for, since it is a, a new program, if anything has to change. Um, so like what Doug said, just saying that um, as far as language, you know, that uh, a site should pass uh, the criteria, the pollinator smart certification criteria on the most recent version of the scorecard. So if you put it that way, um, if, you know, next year for some reason we have to update the scorecard and the points change a little or um, any of the, you know, or if we uh, change to version three, but you've referenced version two, um, that's kind of how you how you get around that um, without having to continually update the wording. Important point. Okay, so we heard from a few of you about what you could do that might make a change uh, for your own community. So just in the last few minutes, is if does anyone have any other comment, any of our listeners who maybe have learned about this program for the first time today? Is there anything that would be of additional help for you and I will read from Nicole. Thanks for putting it in the chat here. Um, so Nicole was saying that her microphone doesn't work, but she's a regional planner for the New River Valley Regional Commission. And she's interested in exposing folks in their area to pollinator smart solar. She's also thinking about the utility scale solar arrays at Carillion, and if they can be retrofitted into a pollinator walk for patients or the like and maybe get more buy-in with a project like that and Carillion is a hospital. Awesome, thanks Nicole for doing that. Anyone else have a comment? Okay, um, Renee, is there anything that you wanted to mention in the last few moments for the folks on the call? First of all, I just would like to say I appreciate everyone's time today, um, taking time out of your busy schedule to listen uh, to some information about a, a program that already exists and hopeful that we start seeing more uh, feedback from folks in terms of the program itself as well as submittal of scorecards. You know, nothing's hurt by submitting a scorecard. And also uh, appreciate the valuable feedback we've heard today. I think certainly there's a continuing need uh, for increased awareness around this program and um, you know, continuing workshops like this uh, to continue to move the, the program forward. So thank you to everyone. Uh, yeah, I would just echo Renee's comments. I mean, I have a long list of um, ideas here that, that your feedback has spawned and um, I, I appreciate everyone's time and, and input. Thanks. Great. So with that, Katie, is there anything you wanted to mention for resources? Um, just uh, what I've thrown up here on the screen, um, that we are always open to feedback, um, and also we are here to help. So um, if you have any questions or you need any additional guidance, um, just reach out to the pollinator.smart at dcr.virginia.gov email. You can CC me if you'd like, you don't have to. Um, we'll be continuing next year with targeted meetings like this. Um, and a survey will be following this meeting um, just to get uh, additional feedback since everything you said has been so valuable to us today. Um, in year three, we'll also be rolling out a series of training for people that are interested um, about the program and the certification process. And we have so much more planned, so. Um, yeah, again, uh, the website's pollinatorsmart.va.org, and then uh, the email is up here for if you need to reach us. And there will be a recording of this particular workshop, and that will become available on, is it on the DEQ website? DCR website, DCR. The, the Pollinator Smart website, yep. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. And have a great rest of your week.